Yes, it's crucial. Uh, good evening. I'm Mark Bowley, the Chairman of the City of London Policy and Resources Committee, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening for this event. We're delighted to be working with the Centre for Policy Studies on a, a subject that is of huge interest to the city, and I have to say of huge interest to me personally as a former member of the government's regulatory policy committee. Uh, regulation is a major subject for all businesses and indeed many politicians in Britain, so we're in for a most interesting evening. That's quite enough for me to introduce proceedings. Can I hand over, over to Tim Knox? Tim. Mark, uh, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you to everyone at the City of London Corporation for all their help in putting this event on, particularly Adam Maddock and Giles French. We were delighted at the CPS uh, when Michael accepted our invitation uh, to speak here and we were also equally delighted that when, to hear that Michael had been appointed Minister of State in the Department of Business last September. Michael is a very old friend of the CPS and has been a member of our council for many years. He was, as you know, previously Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party, where he became a very well-known voice on Newsnight and the Today programme, uh, defending the policies of the Conservative Party. And as this is one of Michael's first speeches since his appointment, we're delighted that he's given it, he's giving it to us at the CPS. His responsibilities at the department include competitiveness, economic growth, and deregulation, three subjects very close to our hearts. As you know, the CPS has been focusing on these subjects for some time, believing in low tax, strong nation state, freedom, and a light regulatory touch. But we can only do this with your support. We rely entirely on the help and generosity of our supporters. So please do fill in your forms if you haven't already. And if you do so, we can promise to continue the fight on those themes. But Morris, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, I'd, I'd just like to say a word introducing Michael, who I've known very well for a long time. Um, people do generally say, as Tim just did, that um, Michael is famous for defending the policies of the Conservative Party and the government on television. I'd go a lot further than that. I think Michael has proved himself to be one of the most brilliant spokesmen for what the Conservative Party believes that the party currently has. So um, I I'm very pleased that he's now taken charge of this enormously important um, subject, as, as Mark said. Um, but it would, be a, it would be, I think, a great loss to the party and to the government if Michael wasn't as regular an appearer on news programmes and comment programmes as he has been when he was Deputy Chairman of the party. So I hope that will, that will happen. I'd like to um, set up Michael's talk in a particular way, if I may. You've just heard from Tim that, and from Mark that um, Michael is responsible for regulation. Um, the reason this is a very crucial subject, as Mark was saying, is that certainly at the CPS, and I'm sure nearly all of you here um, agree that competition is the, is the essence of capitalism and why it works. It was put best by Professor Lionel Robbins from LSE, who described a free market in this way. He, he said, every day, hundreds of people cast their votes for the thousands of products and services on offer and that from this competition to win their votes, better and better products and services emerge. That, that's the reason that we believe in free markets, for the, because it brings the best outcome for all. However, we are all living through the experience that it has not brought the best outcome for all. And rather than say, this is a failure of free markets, which is an unattractive conclusion to come to, we generally say, this is a failure of regulation. And therefore, what that means is that we need more regulation. That itself is a problematic intellectual road which Michael is going to steer us with tonight. It leads to intellectual difficulties of two kinds. First, it means that Mrs. Merkel must be right then. Because if there is to be more regulation as the 
um, solution to free markets which have got out of control, then obviously she must be right that this regulation should be across border, not just in one country. That raises all kinds of problems, as we are all aware. The second problem is for the Conservative Party, because to say that the solution to anything is more regulation would be regarded as really quite un-Tory. Tories are supposed to believe in less regulation, not more. So here, here is the point that we, the intellectual point that um, we've come to as a result of this crisis. And there is nobody who's going to be better at steering the, the country through the difficulties I just described than Michael Fallon. We're very honoured that he's here, and I know you'll enjoy what he's got to say. Thank you uh, very much, Morris, and good evening. And I hope you will excuse an unregulated cold. And thank you for the kind introduction. I don't think there can be few more appropriate places to deliver a speech on regulation than to the CPS. The Conservative Party, and more importantly the country, owes a tremendous debt to Sir Keith Joseph and Margaret Thatcher for founding the CPS in 1974. For younger Conservatives, like myself then, the radical nature of what the CPS set out to do in reviving the philosophy and principles of a free society was fundamental. The turbulence of those times cannot be understated. Ideas that are now the mainstream, such as sound money and low taxes, were painted as extreme and had to be fought. And in making his case to reconnect the Conservative Party to economic liberalism, Keith Joseph focused his fire on both Labour and Conservative previous economic policy in his famous Upminster speech that attacked, and I quote, 30 years of socialistic fashion, 30 years of interventions, 30 years of good intentions, 30 years of disappointment. But his aim wasn't simply to remind Conservatives of the economic theory that they had so badly lost sight of in government. It also addressed a wider freedom, widening the space between what is compulsory and what is forbidden. Isn't self-centeredness? It's a mistake to equate liberalism with selfishness. On the contrary, I believe that maximizing freedom gives all of us the ability and the opportunity to do more for our families, for our communities. It enables institutions, local and voluntary, as well as national, to flourish. A freer society, by definition, means limiting the role of the state. As Margaret Thatcher argued, I quote, what marks out our conservative vision is the insight that the state, government, only underpins the conditions for a prosperous and fulfilling life. It cannot generate them. It is from that insight that our attitude to economic freedom flows. Now, free markets depend, of course, on some regulation to function. Markets since ancient and medieval times have involved controls to varying degrees. Core components are free and fair exchange, the rights to property, to enforcement of contract, and to redress. But these are individual rights, exercisable and exercised beyond the fiat of government. They involve trusting the people. And those political creeds that want to exercise by power, by command and control, don't like that. <coughs> Notice how our opponents always preface their description of free markets as unfettered free markets. Having lost the argument for a bigger state and ever higher taxes, as concepts like privatization, wider share ownership, and individual property rights traveled the world, 
When Labour returned to power in 1997, they lighted upon regulation as an alternative means of control. Over the next 13 years, they passed over 500 primary acts of parliament. They introduced six new regulations every working day of those 13 years. They imposed over 90 billion of additional costs on business. Tolle's tax guide doubled in size to over 11,000 pages. Companies, large and small, were loaded with social and environmental obligations by ministers who preferred not to make the case for funding those out of increased taxes. And the result was a decline in the competitiveness of our economy, a weakening in incentives for enterprise and entrepreneurship, an erosion of Britain's reputation as a good place to invest, start or grow a business. As Tacitus warned us nearly 2,000 years ago, corruptissima republica plurime leges, the more laws, the worse the state. A decade into that Labour government, two of its biggest scandals illustrate the point. First, following Gordon Brown's disastrous decision to strip the Bank of England of its supervision of the banking system and to establish instead an entirely new regulatory bureaucracy, the Financial Services Authority. Despite employing over 2,600 people Despite an annual budget of over 300 million pounds, it failed to spot the risks that the banks were taking. It failed to restrict excessive leverage. And despite thousands of pages of guidance and hundreds of circulars, it ended up 10 years later by losing five of the 10 big banks it was entrusted to supervise. That subsequent fallout imposed massive costs on our taxpayers on our, and on our economy. It left us with a generation of debt, both public and private. It almost fatally weakened and unbalanced our economy. And all this in the name of regulation. And a few weeks ago, we had the Francis report into the appalling suffering at the Mid Staffordshire Hospital over exactly the same period 10 years after Labour started. This was, I quote, a serious failure on the part of the Trust Board and, I quote, an insidious negative culture involving a tolerance of poor standards and a disengagement from managerial and leadership responsibilities. But here too was a massive failure of regulation. The NHS wasn't short of rules and regulations, inspectors and quangos of all kinds, yet Monitor, responsible for trusts, and the Healthcare Commission, responsible for standards of care, failed to act. Both these huge disasters, whatever their other causes, had one thing in common. They were failures of regulation. Hundreds of bureaucrats and regulators and inspectors failed to spot that banks were collapsing or that patients were dying. And we're already hearing that some of the contributory causes of the horsemeat scandal may well have been the perverse effect of new regulations on the composition of mincemeat and on the movement and slaughter of horses. That was the past. Let me now turn to this government's approach. And as the subject of deregulation is so vast, I want to focus on the effect of regulation on our economy, its impact on growth, on innovation and competition, our progress to date in tackling it, and how finally, I believe, we need to go even further and faster. We want the UK to be the best place to start and grow and finance a business. 
And that's because if we don't focus on enterprise and champion people who risk their own money to create jobs for others, then we're not going to be able to compete globally. Fundamentally, regulation acts to divert the scarce resources of business away from their productive uses towards unproductive compliance. Not only does this impose costs on business and chip away at its competitiveness, but since economic growth is driven by improvements in productivity, we all suffer. So promoting deregulation is a core component of our strategy for growth. Our approach is to consider regulation as a last resort rather than the first option. And where regulation is absolutely needed, we must ensure regulation is applied in a more business-friendly way. Overbearing regulation is obviously tiresome for our larger established companies. But they have the resources to cope. Too often, business regulation acts by unwittingly protecting their interests. We want to encourage, on the contrary, more challenger businesses, the dynamic upstarts that will drive innovation, exploit new technologies, and bring more competition into established markets. If we look to the United States, there are a range of factors that help create companies such as Google, a combination of a risk-taking culture, readily available finance, good links to universities, a plethora of garages, but also a regulatory environment that promotes innovation and incentives to invest. So while regulation impacts all businesses, Compliance costs pose a barrier to growth or even to market entry, especially for small and medium-sized mid -sized firms. These are the backbone of our economy, <coughs> generating nearly half of all private sector output. Studies show that over the last three years, fewer than 10% of high-growth firms have generated over 50% of all our new jobs. There is a strong body of academic evidence pointing to the impact that regulation has in creating entry barriers in markets. Those barriers make it harder for entrepreneurs to start new businesses, they restrict competition, and they maintain the position of inefficient incumbents. I'm optimistic in this country about enterprise. There is a huge appetite, particularly amongst younger people, to take the risk of starting their own business. Over the last year, 450,000 new businesses were created here, more than any other year on record. And that's why we have focused our efforts on deregulation on micro-businesses, those employing fewer than 10 people, where we've introduced a moratorium that no new regulations will be imposed at all until 2014. And I hope we can continue that after that. Our task for other businesses is to deregulate where we can. Let me tell you what we've done so far. At home, for domestic regulation, our strategy has been to stem the flow of new regulation through the introduction of our one-in, one-out, and now a much more punishing one-in, two-out rule, to tackle the existing stock through the red tape challenge, and then to improve how regulation is enforced through our focus on enforcement reviews. All that aims to help us deliver the Prime Minister's ambition of this being the first government in modern history to complete its term of office, having reduced the overall burden of regulation rather than having increased it. Now, at first, we have introduced, as I said, the groundbreaking one-in, one-out rule, under which any increase in the cost of regulation must be at least matched by reduction elsewhere by the same department. That's been running for over two years now and will have saved businesses over one billion pounds in regulatory costs by this summer. From the 1st of January, 
I've tightened that screw with an even more challenging one-in, two-out rule under which departments must find two pounds of saving for extra one pound of extra cost that they impose. More importantly, that is beginning to embed a culture change that puts business needs at the heart of the Whitehall machine and makes it much more difficult for ministers to consider regulation in the first place. Other countries are following that lead. Canada has recently announced a one-in-one-out system. France, yes, France announced last month that they were preparing guidance on applying, if you'll excuse my French, une norme créée pour une norme supprimée, the one-in-one-out principle. Poland has introduced a purer rule whereby a regulation has to be removed before a new one can be introduced, and my officials have given evidence on the same rule to the United States. Secondly, the red tape challenge, which invites businesses to tell us where action on red tape is most urgently needed. We have committed to scrapping or substantially overhauling at least 3,000 regulations that affect business. And we've already identified 1,400 of those for repeal or substantial overhaul. Measures implemented here are saving businesses over 155 million pounds a year. From this April, we'll have removed hundreds of thousands of low-risk businesses and shops from unnecessary health and safety inspections. We have reformed no-win, no-fee cases, and we're banning referral fees, helping to tackle the compensation and health and safety culture. Our primary authority partnerships, legally binding agreements that give businesses that operate across the country assured regulatory advice and ensure consistency between local authority areas, reducing duplication of inspections and paperwork, have already engaged 640 large firms across nearly 100 local authorities, covering over 60,000 premises. Thirdly, evidence about how regulation is enforced has identified many common issues across different sectors including inconsistency of fees and charges and the need for regulators to take account of their impact on industry. Our focus on enforcement drive is aimed at improving the way regulations are administered by enforcement agency. We've been looking at specific areas like pubs, chemicals, volunteer events, coastal and marine and fire safety. And along with the evidence provided through the Red Tape Challenge, both programmes have shown it's possible to get a very clear picture of the impact uh, of uh, regulation and its enforcement within just a few weeks and to identify areas for significant improvement. A very good example is the plethora of licences and permits that are potentially required to get a coastal development project off the ground. For example, a small dock or a quayside or a mini marina. You might need to deal with a marine management organisation for a marine licence, the Environment Agency for water discharge permits, with Natural England as statutory advisors on the impact of wildlife, in addition to the local planning authority. During that review, which I'm publishing tomorrow, we identified that businesses often faced rival regulators who failed to agree quickly enough, or even at all, who should be in the lead. So tomorrow I'm announcing a marine concordat, which will set out a process for identifying a lead regulator to coordinate the approvals and give business a single point of entry, ensuring business uh, planning decisions are taken more quickly. Other examples are the forest of building codes, where the red tape challenge identified local authorities who were creating multiple different sets of requirements and guidance. We're now running a review that will introduce a single set. Through this process of focus on enforcement, we're presenting the compelling evidence from business and the trade associations to the regulators, so they have to respond. That results in regulators agreeing to faster reform, reforms than compared to conventional consultation. 
However, the complexity is also in the navigation of the system. Where enforcement is well targeted, the state can still confuse, delay, and downright instruct by being the opposite of joined up. For example, we want new infrastructure projects built as rapidly as possible, but some have hardly started, while others have stalled. Why? It's not always about funding. It's often about the complex interaction of permissive requirements. It's about who has the statutory duty to comment, when and, and in what order. It's about who can challenge that, and in some cases do so simply to frustrate the project. It's these kind of issues that hold back growth, big, big and small, at different stages at development. Why is it so hard to get a road connection to a new factory? or build a new roundabout to improve traffic flow? Why is it so hard to find out what I need as an entrepreneur to move into my first office or onto my first site? In the autumn statement, we announced that we would be launching a successor program to the Red Tape Challenge. The next phase will be clearly targeted on growth and focused on fewer improvements which have more significant impacts on business. In short, endless tinkering creates uncertainty, whereas decisive action in a few sectors enables entrepreneurs to adjust to the new climate and get on with running their businesses. <coughs> Where they are necessary, regulators exist primarily, of course, to regulate for the protection of the public, for the consumer, or for broader social and environmental objectives. And we don't want to undermine those core purposes. But the scale of the regulatory state is now very large. For the first time, we have collected and are publishing data on the non-economic regulators. Bodies such as Natural England or the Highways Agency. There are more than 55 non-economic regulators with a combined budget of approximately four billion pounds and employing some 55,000 staff between them. That's a huge resource which can be brought to bear on our wider economic objective of growth. And we can encourage compliant businesses to grow through proportionate regulatory activity without compromising public protection. Let me give you one example of this by one of our findings through the chemicals review. We found that some companies in the chemical sector were being encouraged by their own trade associations to avoid growing beyond a point at which they would be brought within a particular <coughs> enforcement regime. So there is a profound need to redefine how regulation works, putting regulators on the side of the majority of law-abiding business. And that's why I have decided to explore how to place a legal duty on all those non-economic non regulators, all 55 of them, to have regard to growth in their decision-making. And we'll shortly be publishing a consultation on how to frame that duty that can achieve both prosperity and protection. So we've taken a bold approach domestically. We also want a rigorous approach at a European level, particularly as we now estimate that up to half of all UK regulatory costs comes from Europe. The Prime Minister reiterated in his recent speech on Europe the need to free businesses from regulation which damages competitiveness. As Angela Merkel has pointed out, Europe has 25% of global GDP, but has to finance 50% of global social spending. That is unsustainable, and that's why we're making the case for a reformed, outward-looking Europe. And here, the United Kingdom is not an outlier. Our regulatory reform agenda is already backed by nearly half the member states, and our persistence is beginning to deliver results. The Commission's new regulatory fitness communication, published in December, 
met six of the key proposals in our 10-point plan, including a new program to start reducing the regulatory burden at the European level. One third of all the Commission's proposals in 2012 that significantly impacted on business contained an adaptation designed to help small and mid-sized businesses. An exemption, for example, from EU accounting rules will benefit up to 1.4 million small businesses in this country. And one year on, it's taken time, but one year on from the recommendation that our Prime Minister got at the European Council in December 2011, we've now seen the first two micro-exemption proposals, one on copyright and the other on drug licensing charges, where the smallest business are now exempted entirely. Smarter regulation is where we lead, but there are increasing signs that other member states are adopting similar ambitious approaches in their own domestic markets. We have the Regulatory Policy Committee here at home to validate and scrutinise the impact assessments that ministers bring forward to justify that cost, the two pounds out for every one pound in. At least four other member states, the Netherlands, Czech Republic, Germany and Sweden, now have similar independent watchdogs. Others, including France and Poland, have independent in-house verification. The Dutch have a target to reduce regulatory burdens in their domestic legislation by over two and a half billion euro. The French, like us, have restricted themselves to only two common commencement dates for their domestic legislation. Now, firms have long complained about our government departments adding additional regulation to EU laws, including recently laws on energy efficient buildings and health and safety at work, which puts our firms at a disadvantage compared to their European counterparts, where those member states have not transposed the European directive in such a way. So in 2011, we introduced tougher new rules across Whitehall to put a stop to this so-called gold plating. And our new figures show that from July 2011, when these rules came in, to December 2012, that we have effectively ended the practice of gold plating. There were 88 directives that we adopted during that 18 month period, including some involving animal health and welfare, protection of the environment and transport. And of those 88, there was no evidence of gold plating that placed additional burdens on business. But I want to keep the pressure up on Whitehall so that all EU legislation is only implemented here in the least injurious way. From now on, ministers will be required to transpose only the minimum necessary to comply with each directive. And I intend to block any new legislative proposals that gold plate any legislation unless it can be proved that adding more detail would actually benefit business. Now, it's important that in the work of deregulation, perceptions and reality coincide. And the evidence is starting to indicate that business is noting the benefit of our reforms. Headline findings from our 2012 business perception survey saw a steady decline in the number of businesses perceiving regulation to be a challenge when running a business. Regulation is considered now less of an obstacle than securing customers than obtaining access to finance and enduring levels of taxation. Nearly half the businesses believe the burden of regulation in this coming year will get no worse. That's up from a third uh, two years ago. So those figures demonstrate that the UK is certainly moving in the right direction. But there is still a feeling that the burden of regulation remains too high. Why is that? Is it because regulation means different things to different people? 
You might be sitting there thinking, well, it's legislation. Others might think a code of practice constitutes regulation, or it's tax or form filling. Research undertaken by Cumbria University, which explored this, concluded that regulation can't simply be equated to measurable costs. Other aspects, such as the anxiety generated by the threat of litigation on regulation or the pace of change, need also to be recognised. Given the complexity of the regulatory landscape and what it means to different audiences, while we can remove unnecessary and over-regulation to improve perceptions, we need to work on making the regulatory experience a better one. And emerging findings from that analysis has identified one key theme, that business is most exercised by the apparent constant churn in regulations. Even when we reduce regulation, the long-run benefits can be offset by upfront costs as businesses have to change their internal systems and processes to take advantage of greater flexibility. Churn can also lead to confusion heighten the anxiety, thus worsening the perception of the burden. So getting the rules right, therefore, isn't enough. We also need to tell people exactly what the rules are, how to maximise compliance, and how to ensure a fair and inexpensive way of resolving any problems that do arise uh, is in place. Now, Conservatives, of course, have faith in the robust free markets that have characterised the Anglo-Saxon model. But after 40 years of European Union membership, and half of those domestically under Labour governments, we also need to recognise an economic culture that perhaps owes a little more to the continental approach than we like to admit. That, in my view, is all the more urgent because as well as the huge legacy of public and private debt, the UK economy has been recovering more slowly than we hoped and continues to sustain a very large trade deficit. In the five years since the financial crisis, we've never done better than 15th out of the G20 in terms of balance of trade. So supply-side reforms are therefore more and not less urgent to improve UK competitiveness and rebalance the economy. And the outgoing Bank of England governor made similar points recently. And I can see at least three areas where more deregulation can play its part in helping to free up markets. First, employment regulation. Businesses regularly tell me that this is the biggest burden for them, even though it can be worse for some of their European competitors. But I see an important part of my role to ensure that, again, perceptions and reality coincide, both by reducing over-regulation and by ensuring that businesses know what the rules actually are. Over-regulated labour markets restrict the opportunity to create new jobs. We have introduced a series of reforms as part of our employment law review, many based on Adrian Beecroft's report to create greater flexibility for businesses. Those reforms build on those of the 1980s and reverse some of the re-regulation of subsequent years. It's already harder to take cases to an employment tribunal and it'll become harder still when fees are payable later this year. But we ought to reflect that youth unemployment in this country is 21%. In Germany, thanks to vigorous supply-side reforms a few years ago, it's only 8%. So there is a case for ensuring that where government intervenes, for example, in setting the youth rate of the minimum wage or the level and indexation of the job seekers' allowance, those regulatory flaws are not set at levels that price our young people out of jobs. Second, one of the main barriers to growth I hear about constantly from small business is access to finance. We have put in place a package of measures to improve the supply 
of affordable credit to SMEs, such as funding for lending and the business finance partnerships. Yet the banks can reasonably complain, and do complain, that the levels of capital they're now required to hold frustrates their ability to increase the lending that companies need to grow. Banking regulators, too, need to consider the impact of their decision-making on the wider needs of the economy. It can't be right that 85% of SME lending lies in the hands of just four big banks. That isn't Anglo-Saxon competition. It's an unhealthy concentration reinforced by protective regulation, especially in its restriction of access for the newer banks to the payment systems. Given the measures we have already put in place to protect depositors and to ensure rapid resolution of failing banks, there is surely a case for exempting the newer and smaller banks from over-restrictive capital requirements. Third and finally, take planning. An efficient, well-understood and stable planning system is vital for a strong economy. But the last government passed 15 planning acts. Six years after the main act in 2004, fewer than 60 out of 335 planning authorities actually had the core strategies they were supposed to have. After 13 years of top-down housing targets regulated from the centre, they ended up with the lowest number of new homes built in any peacetime year since the 1920s. Now, we have simplified the planning system and deregulated it to encourage sustainable development, but we need to do more. Measures in the Growth and Infrastructure Bill will unlock developments which have stalled due to local social housing agreements made at the top of the housing boom and which could not, thanks to regulation, otherwise be reopened. The Prime Minister is surely right to call for fewer sequential consultations and a more restricted right to judicial review. And today, we're inviting applications from enterprise zones for up to £60 million to turn shovel-ready sites into job-ready sites. That's an ambitious model that removes barriers to private sector growth with lower ta tax levels for business, a simplified planning system, and overall in those zones, a much lighter regulatory burden. In conclusion, we face an unprecedented challenge to compete in the global race. It is no coincidence that the <coughs> fastest growing economies favor deregulation and lack our social costs. Our approach to regulation needs to be redefined and reformed to fit that context. By the end of this parliament, we will have lower corporation tax rates than the growth markets of Brazil, China, Indonesia, and India. But we need to be as ambitious with regulatory reform to ensure our longer term competitiveness. Only by taking a robust approach to regulation will we have companies that drive innovation, that exploit new technologies, and meet the challenge of those emerging countries. So this is all about continuing to change our culture towards enterprise. Be in no doubt about the government's commitment. We have made some progress, but I agree with the business community that more radical action is required. So that's why we're upping the pace. We need to deregulate further and faster, both at home and in Europe, to remove barriers to growth. I have set out how stemming the flow of regulation and putting regulators on the side of compliant businesses will cut the costs for business and will end overlapping enforcement. By cracking down further, on gold plating and using alliances in Europe, we can start to turn the regulatory tide there too. My thoughts tonight for freeing up further youth employment and access to bank finance 
show to you there is an appetite in government to deliver more regulation. This country can compete and will deliver. And I'm determined for my part to help business do just that. Thank you. Michael, that was marvellous. Thank you very much. And you've covered all the, all the ground that we were hoping that you would and touched on some of the most important subjects in current political debate. Um, I've made a long list of questions. I'm sure some of you have too. So who would like to start? Would you, would you be, be kind enough to... Um, there's a microphone, I think, coming. If you'd be kind enough when you're asking a question to stand up, please, and also say whichever organisation your name and obviously in whichever organisation you're from, if you're from an organisation. Should we start there in the aisle? Andrew Lillico, uh, I'm with Europe Economics. Um, given that you've told us that um, firms, that business finds the cost of adapting to regulatory change even more burdensome than the cost of adapting to past misregulation, if you were sitting here as a business, would you prefer to hear a speech from a minister uh, boasting of the many reforms he was introducing or a speech from a minister Nicholas Ridley style boasting of the many things he was planning not to do? Well, of course. It's, uh, thank you, Andrew. It's, uh, it's, it's, of course, a balance. I mean, there is some burdens, but there are burdens that we can lift and we are lifting. And going through the red tape challenge, talking to business sector by sector, we have identified stuff that can be removed without sufficient, uh, without imposing extra cost in its removal. Um, making things simpler, for example. Exempting smaller businesses, for example. These are things that don't necessarily impose extra cost. But um, I don't resolve from what I said about churn. Um, one of the advantages, for example, in common commencement dates is that regulation can only now begin at two points in the year. I wish it was only one, but at least now it's only two. So businesses know that after the 6th of April, no new regulation can start to take effect to the 1st of October. They have more time to prepare. So it is a balance. I think over here, please. Uh, Martin Barrow, the Jardim Masson Group. Um, Minister, thank you for an excellent uh, report on work in progress. Um, I like the one in, two out, but a related key point in all of this is what I call the danger of comfort in complexity. The problem is that you get rid of two, but the <coughs> one coming in might be very long and complicated, and we've all lost the art of pracy. Uh, the, as manuals get thicker, that increases risk in a business, not reduces it. What we've got to learn is how to simplify the content, not just the number of rules, but what they actually state. And I think that's a key challenge going forward. An awful lot of, probably some accountants and lawyers here who help contribute to lengthening all these processes. What we want are shorter papers, more and more board meetings now. We spend more and more time on compliance and regulation, less time on the key strategic issues. So we want shorter regulation, please, as well as less regulation, if you get the point. I have a one-page paper here on the danger of comfort and complexity. If anybody would like it, let me know later. But good luck with that too, Minister. Well, thanks very much. I mean, some of this, of course, lies in the drafting. We have this tradition that uh, the draftsman should try and cover all the major eventualities that might arise. So we spend a lot of time as ministers when bills are being considered um, trying to make sure that our clauses cover every kind of uh, situation. And we need, to, we need to get away from that. It is quite striking when it comes to the transposition of uh, European Union directives, how uh, uh, Germany, for example, uh, a, loyal, a loyally country, how uh, Germany um, uh, traditionally now transposes far less than we do and leaves these matters to the courts and is unafraid to be taken to court for not uh, fully transposing a directive in a way that we rather, uh, we rather shun from. So that is one point. I would make the, the, the final point, though, on one in, uh, two out. It does make it much more difficult for ministers to regulate at all. They have been at this now for over two years. And if you consider a minister in a, in a Whitehall department that is now itching to regulate on, on, on whatever it is, 
He's got to go back to his own statute book and find some regulation that imposes twice the, the cost and take that out before he can come to us. And these costs are independently validated by our regulatory policy committee. Um, uh, and he's got to find uh, new regulation, uh, regulations he hadn't considered taking out before and, and get rid of them. Now that is becoming harder and harder and our latest statement of new regulation covering the six months from this January to the end of June shows that slowly but surely the tide is beginning to dry up and we've had some very good examples of ministers actually coming to us and saying in the end they've decided not to publish regulations. They will go and look for different forms of achieving the same end by publishing advice, using websites or whatever rather than yet another statutory instrument. Uh, I'm coming, let's take Patrick in row two and then I'm coming up to the you at the back. I'd like to congratulate Michael on an excellent presentation. It's tremendous to have someone in the Department of Business and Enterprise who actually believes in business and enterprise. It's a dramatic change, I think. Um, he, uh, during the course of your speech, um, you mentioned that it's very important to get more and more cash into small companies. I was wondering whether you're aware that the FSA is in effect sabotaging all the help that the government is giving to get money into small companies. I mean, we've got terrific tax advantage with EISs and things like that. But the FSA now say we mustn't invest in small companies, which they regard as high risk, unless a committee of the firm you work for say that you can put money into a, the portfolio of a private client. And I mean, it's obviously very difficult to get a committee to agree to put any small company on a list of approval because any small company can go wrong. So effectively, the FSA is sabotaging government policy. Well, I agree with that. I mean, the regulator, all these regulators need to wake up to their responsibility to consider the impact of their decisions on growth. And I think we need to start at the, at the bottom end and look what needs to be done to get more finance. I mean, if we restrict the supply of finance, and we also, as I indicated with our younger people, restrict the supply of labour. It's fairly unsurprising that the economy is not growing. We need to look at where the problems are, and behind those problems are regulations. And it's particularly true in your area of helping entrepreneurs get their money into uh, new and, 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 and start-up and exciting businesses. Coming, to the, coming back, sir, to the, to the back on the left. Do please say your name and organisation. Uh, yeah, T Tony Lodge with the CPS. Uh, Michael, um, you made a very important point about reducing costs and barriers, but in, uh, on April 1st, we introduced in Britain a carbon price floor of 20 euros a tonne, when carbon on the continent is trading at 4 euros 50, which is quite a big gap. Um, I'm just interested in really Biz's attitude to this how, and how it will affect energy intensive industry. Well. I mean, this, this is what happens when you intervene in markets. We've inherited this, uh, this carbon floor, and I'm now having to find, uh, thanks to the Treasury, over £150 million. To, and I'm having to design a compensation scheme for energy-intensive industries, precisely to compensate that from this arrangement that uh, we've inherited from our predecessors. Um, th this is a fairly absurd waste of, of, of your money. Uh, but this is the situation we're now in. If, if governments intervene in markets they don't understand, um, there are consequences, and we all have to pay for those consequences. I'll be publishing shortly which industries have to be covered, when they can apply for compensation, uh, and all the rest of it. I think we're coming here to row two. I'm coming to Mark in a moment. Please go ahead, sir, in row three. You said earlier... Do please say your name and organisation. Pascal, Pascal Mitram, Associate of CPS. You said earlier that the previous regulatory regime makes it very harder for banks to lend to businesses, but surely you as a government can force bailed-out banks to lend to businesses? Why, why don't you do that? Well, we are doing that in a number of ways. We've introduced, uh, through credit easing, various schemes. There are schemes like funding for lending. Um, there's some evidence that funding for lending is now getting through to the mortgage market, but not fully yet getting through to the small and medium-sized enterprises who need it. 
Um, now we're tackling that, we're talking to the banks about that and uh, encouraging more uh, take up of government schemes but above all more transparency. Given that 85% uh, of SME lending is in the hands of four banks, I see no reason at all why we shouldn't be publishing the scale of that SME lending by constituency so that every member of parliament can see what is actually being lent by each of the big four banks in his or her constituency. I think we're entitled to a little more transparency given the, the involvement of the taxpayer and what is being done to, uh, to encourage lending. So that is one answer, but we also need the FSA to, to wake up to their responsibilities. Money is not getting through to SMEs at the moment. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I go around the country and around the regions of our country talking to SMEs the, the whole time. I step in with, on your behalf, uh, grants from the Regional Growth Fund, loans from the Advanced Manufacturing Supply Chain Initiative, uh, business startup support schemes, grants and loans of all kinds that we are making available as a government because the banks are not uh, stepping up to the plate. Now, part of that clearly is the crisis, but it is also um, the restrictions that are being placed on them by their regulators. Um, we need to address that. Mark Merrier. Uh, Mark Berlioz, former member of the Regulatory Policy Committee. You referred to the impact that the policies are having on ministers who want to regulate, but regulatory policy rather leaves untouched regulators, um, either the economic regulators or others such as the Legal Services Board, and they are responsible for the bulk of regulation in the country. How can you make the policies you're applying apply more generally across the economy as the financial sector certainly hasn't seen much of the benefit of government regulatory policy? Well, the principal way we're going to do this is by imposing this duty, consider the impact on growth, which um, we've been looking at since the autumn and which uh, Heseltine touches on his report. Um, at the moment, a body like uh, the Environment Agency or the Highways Agency, when it's being consulted by somebody who wants to put a new roundabout to get a new business development going, none of these bodies um, have any requirement to consider the impact of their decision-making on the growth of the economy. If we put that into their statutes for all of them, then it means that those who are dealing with them and are frustrated by dealing with them are able then to question their decision-making, indeed question it in the courts, by saying they didn't fully take account <coughs> of, the, of the need to uh, consider the, the impact of growth in the decisions uh, that they took. And that will cover an amazing range of bodies, as I've said, uh, the non-economic regulators of, of all kinds, which I think really will start to change the, uh, change the culture. There are other ways in which we're tackling this. I discovered a document called the Regulators Compliance Code. I was never quite sure when I first opened this whether it was how you comply with a regulator or how the regulator complies with you. Um, I'm getting that code re rewritten uh, with, a, with, a, with a sharper title and it will set out the things that regulators ought to do as a minimum, have a level of service, the standard of service that their clients or their customers are entitled to expect, have a system of appeal. Some regulators have no system of appeal at all. All you can do is ask the man who took the or woman who took the original decision. That isn't right. Some are allowed to set their own fees and charges that bear no relationship to the actual cost of the regulation that they're doing. There are inconsistencies right across the board and we need to ensure that the regulators themselves as a group start to, to join in uh, the, the, the greater responsibility of growth. And I think probably this is the penultimate question. In the, yes, in row three. Richard Brewster, uh, Bankers Investment Trust. Uh, Michael, Minister, thank you very much for making a very clear presentation on the, uh, the regulations and how you're trying to get rid of them. And I can see it being very much in, in line with Conservative Party policy. And I just wondered, in the coalition, 
whether there are any areas that you haven't been able to tackle because of difficulties with your partners in coalition. Well, you're, you're tempting me here, uh, the Department of Business. Uh, the Department of Business has uh, seven or six and a half ministers. We share uh, Lord Green with the Foreign Office, and two of those are our Liberal Democrats. Um, the Liberal Democrats have particular responsibility for the employment law portfolio. Um, and they were not able to accept Adrian Beecroft's proposal that people should be uh, sackable at will, hire, hire and fire, or fire on sight, I think it was characterised by the, uh, uh, by the, um, by the, uh, uh, the opposition. However, almost 80% of the Beecroft report is now being legislated. The consultation period under CHUPI is being reduced, the employment tribunals are being reformed, the vexatious cases are being screened out, the qualifying period is coming down from two years, uh, from going up from one year to two years. And those who go to employment tribunals will have to deposit a fee from this summer. Uh, we are working our way through these proposals. It is only at the very edge of each of these uh, packages of report that you do occasionally find things that the, the Liberal Democrats uh, can't particularly stomach. So these, I mean, it is a coalition, and we have to work with them on that. But um, in terms of deregulation itself, uh, the committee, uh, the cabinet committee, is uh, which I have to present proposals to and to block colleagues who want to bring new regulations. That committee is chaired by my secretary of state, and I, I have to tell you that he himself has been uh, has been right behind this. Uh, this, this drive to cut the cost on business. If it's all right with you, Michael, I'm going to take, uh, there are so many questions, but we've, we've actually come to the end of time. But I'm going to, in fairness to the man who's been putting his hand up at the back with a piece of paper, would you like to ask the last question from the floor, and then I'm going to exercise my right to ask Michael the last question in the evening. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Robert Wickham. Uh, Michael, thank you very much. It is the matter of control of the regulators that concerns me. Uh, I've had two instances over the last two months of senior inspectors saying the uh, plan for growth means nothing in statutory terms, and they were going to ignore it, which caused me a little consternation. Uh, bearing in mind, sadly, Professor Buchanan died from uh, George Mason University, it is only that body of theory that explains this great problem of dealing with regulators. Um, just an observation, but thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you, Robert. I mean, that is exactly the point I've been driving at, is we do need to put regulators into this business of growth. And the way we're going to do that, and some of them have already accepted it, um, but we'll have to do it by, uh, uh, by imposing it, uh, eventually on all of them, is to simply impose on them that in all their decision-making, they must consider the impact of their decisions on the growth of the businesses that they are regulating. That will be a cultural change that uh, they won't necessarily all welcome. But we can't be in a position where trade associations are actually telling their own members, don't get too big or you'll be caught by a new regulation. That uh, is not the way we're going to grow a successful and modern <coughs> economy. So we need to tackle this. Michael, can I ask you one... Um, why don't you come and sit down, Michael? And I'm going to ask you one... Come and sit down. I'm going to ask Michael one last, um, one last question. You, you said um, several times, Michael, that what was required was culture change. And indeed, that would be the duty of the government to bring around the culture change it wants to seek. So my question really is this. If you were to go and conduct a poll of a statistically representative sample of the UK population, and you were to ask them this question, do you think there should be more regulation of big business or less? What do you think they'd say? Well, I think you've used the word big business there. I think probably uh, they might well still say we want uh, more regulation um, because they've seen these various uh, scandals like horse meat and so on. And I think people feel that large companies need to be controlled. Uh, and I don't think they necessarily have the the faith in markets that, uh, that we have. So I suspect they might well say um, um, more rather than less. What do you think? My, my anxiety would be exactly along those lines. 
Um, in the CPS, we've been, we've been trying to study this subject and we've been inquiring about whether people think, what people think is worse, big companies or big government. And you would be quite surprised by the, by the answers that we've had, which are actually rather along the lines you were anticipating. Could I say to you all, thank you very much indeed for all your questions. Thank you very much for drawing out of Michael his, um, his answers. And of course, thank Michael for what I thought was a brilliant exposition of what the government is trying to do, which we all support. And we support him and hope what he's doing will work and bring exactly the results that he wants. Would you join me in giving Michael a great round of applause? And, and now, um, may I just end by giving a great thank you to Mark